If you have your Bibles and you find your Sunday school lesson today, we're going to look at lesson six, the faith that saves us. The faith that saves us. We're going to open with Hebrews chapter two. Hebrews chapter two. That's how you know that God was a tea and coffee drinker. You know, Hebrews. Ha ha ha. But um if you found your way to Hebrews chapter two, verse number one through three, you don't have to stand, but let's read this together. Here we go. One, two, three. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us, By them that heard him. Our Father in heaven, as we look at this subject, so great a salvation, Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. I pray that you would use me today. Lord, help me to say the things that you would have me to say and to avoid the things that don't need to be said. But Father, I pray that you would get to the hearts of those that are here presently uh, in body, uh, those that are attending online. Uh, Lord, I just pray that your word would go forth and Uh, we know that by your promise it will not return void. Lord, I pray that this lesson would be used for salvation decisions. I pray that this lesson would be used to strengthen believers in their witness. Lord, we just seek seek you today. Lord, we pray that you would do a mighty work today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've looked at Hebrews chapter 2, and we think about verse 1 through 3. There in verse number 3, it talks about so great a salvation. So great a salvation. And so today we look at the faith that saves us. The faith that saves us. If you have not got a lesson yet and you would like one, they are in the back there or you could hold up a hand and maybe Brother Mike would hand one out to you. But I think everybody's got one. All right. So as we think about the faith that saves us, let's look at our lesson overview. It says, in this day of confusion, Christians must understand the truth of God's word regarding the doctrine of of salvation. It is vitally important to equip every saint with scriptural truths which can be used in witnessing to co-workers, friends, and relatives. Before we continue with that lesson overview, understand that doctrine is vitally important. Doctrine is what we know and believe in the Bible. Uh, our doctrine of salvation, of, of all the doctrines, and th- certainly there are doctrines that are equal with each other, Uh, But when I think about the doctrine of salvation, that's way up there. Uh, You know, we think about a lot of doctrine, you know, the doctrine of angelology. You know, what do we know and believe about angels? Not as important as the doctrine of salvation. I might get something wrong about angels, but I don't want to get anything wrong about salvation. So understand, church, understand if you're listening online, the doctrine of salvation is vitally important, and that's what we're going to study today. It continues in the lesson overview. Through study, Christians can prepare to answer people's questions about God's saving grace using the authority of the Bible. Salvation points to the core of God's love, the gift of His Son on the cross. The truths in this lesson enable Christians to make a difference with their lives each day. I'm so appreciative that I can stand on the promises of God's Word, on the authority of God's Word. I don't have to... Uh, I don't have to think about, I don't have to struggle with, well, do I feel like he hears me? Or do I, do I feel saved today? It's not about feelings. The Bible says that God is greater than our heart. His word is greater than our feelings. And there are times, and I don't know about you, but myself, there's times where maybe I've, I've made the, the choice to sin and, and sinned and I don't feel saved. And you know, it's like, Lord, if I was really saved, why would I do that? But God's word tells me that, you know, I'm not going to be perfect. It tells me also that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we can take those promises to the bank, so to speak. We can can lean on them. The lesson aim. The purpose of this lesson is to establish a solid foundation of scriptural knowledge regarding the truth of salvation. Regarding the truth. Of salvation, And this brings us into our teaching outline here in a moment. 
But as we think about the faith that saves us, think back to the time when you realized that hell was your destination, forgiveness was your need, and Jesus was the answer. Can you remember where you were? Can you remember when that became real to you? Uh, I know that there's a lot of, uh, maybe, maybe several folks in here. How many, how many of you were saved maybe before you were 13? Anybody here? Several of you, okay. Uh, I cannot identify with that. I have related to you. I was saved when I was 17. Uh, my memory is a little uh, more crisp about the events and things like that. But I've met many people who were saved before they were 13, some uh, before you know, when they were 6 or 7 or 5 years old. And some of them have, uh, have solid, foundational, they understand what happened. It wasn't just a, hey, somebody took me to a room and opened a Bible and said, pray this prayer. Because I think those of us that are in here understand salvation is not in a prayer, it's in a person. It's in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we think about uh, when that salvation decision took place or when that event took place in our life, it ought to stand out to us. And I know it stands out to me. Well, as I read that in the introduction there, think back to the time when you realized hell was your destination. I remember that. Forgiveness was your need. I remember that, and Jesus was the answer. I remember that, and I, I, can't <coughs> I cannot identify with people when they say they fought against the Lord or, or they struggled with that decision, and I know that some folks do, and I'm not, I'm not disregarding that. But I know that for myself, when I realized hell was my destination, that Jesus was the answer, I ran to the cross. I ran to the Savior, and I'm so glad, uh, so glad I had that opportunity. Uh, this study of salvation is designed to equip you and me as we move through an increasingly ignorant society. As I think about uh, sharing with our salvation experiences, multitudes and multitudes of people outside of these walls have no idea what we're talking about. And there will be some that would say, oh yeah, I prayed a prayer, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about real Bible salvation. People have all kinds, this is an illustration, people have all kinds of misguided and inaccurate concepts about God and salvation. For instance, uh, I'm going to read you some quotes from actual letters written to God by children. It says, Dear God, I want to be just like my daddy when I get big, but not with so much hair all over. Sam. Dear God, I went to this wedding and they kissed right in church. Is that okay? Signed, Neil. Dear God, thank you for the baby brother. But I prayed for a puppy. It's like our little girl, that's probably going to be her. She keeps saying she wants a puppy. I'm like, hey, hey, one thing at a time over here. Dear God, we read that Thomas Edison made light, but in Sunday school they said you did. So I bet he stole your idea. Dear God, I bet it is very hard for you to love all of everybody in the whole world. There are only four people in our family, and I can never do it. And so we think about that. So some funny things from kids, and kids will say, who knows what they'll say. That's why you've got to be careful when you have kids. So I'm not even talking about bad words as much as just things that you share at home that you're not supposed to share everywhere, and they just, they'll share with anybody, won't they? Mommy said, don't want to share what mommy said, okay? No. <coughs> But we think about some misguided inaccuracies about God and His Word and about salvation that, that folks will think about, and it's so important we get it right. <clears throat> I recently saw a post from one of my Facebook friends, and it had, uh, it had the Buddha. It had um, one of the Indian gods, the um, Krishna, or I don't know ex exactly who it depicted. And then it had Jesus next, or a depiction of Jesus next to them. And they were all walking, buddy, buddy, hand in hand. And it said, we're all going the same place, just on different, different paths. That may be a sincere thought, but it is sincerely wrong. And we're going to understand some truths about why that is. And so first we go into number one, the truths that define our salvation. The truths that define our salvation. Letter A. All mankind is lost and in need of salvation. All mankind is lost and in need of salvation. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, 
and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. <coughs> Understand, all have sinned. Uh, every person uh, is born lost. My little girl, Bella, she's lost. You know, nobody caught, taught her to be covetous. But I got to tell you, we were in the mall last night, uh, and we were walking around, and we were looking at things, and she was saying, Ooh, I wish I had that at home. I want that. I wish I had this. And she, she looked around and she saw all these things. And I guess I'm starting to understand a little bit about marketing and how all the shiny, kitty, frilly things are on the bottom, aren't they? You know, the, you go by the grocery store, all those sugary cereals, where are they? On the bottom, where all the little kids can see it. And they say, I want it, I want it. And we got to tell her, no, you can't always have everything you want. Uh, but <clears throat> understand that she didn't have to, we didn't teach her that. We didn't teach her that. She was born with it. And so every man is born with that sin nature. John 3.18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You don't, uh, ha there's not an action in your life that makes you become lost. You already are. You already are. And we need to understand letter A, that it's so important is all mankind is lost and in need of salvation. The FBI went into a town to investigate the work of what appeared to be a sharpshooter. They were amazed to find many bullseyes drawn around town with bullets that had penetrated the exact center of their targets. When they finally arrested the man who had been doing the shooting, they asked him about the technique he used to attain such accuracy. His answer was simple. He shot the bullet first and then drew the bullseye later. What happened there? Many pretend to be something they aren't. Church, examine your hearts and lives. Are you pretending this morning? Or are you 100% sure without a shadow of a doubt that you are one of God's? You belong to Him. It's so important that we examine ourselves. We understand that those that are watching, don't be fooled. Don't, don't fall into a trap of, of feelings. Uh, understand that it's important that as we study God's Word, that our salvation lines up with God's Word. Amen? It's essential. So many pretend to be something they are. Don't pretend. Don't pretend. Let her be. Jesus provides the only way of salvation. I related that illustration that had those walking arm in arm and saying, hey, we're all going the same place, just on a different path. That's not what I read in my Bible. The Bible says in John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. What do we see there? Again, it says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. It's not saying, A, I'm not, I'm not one of the ways. I'm not one of the truths. I'm not, one, I, I'm not a way to life. It's saying, I am the way, the truth, the life. So when you run into someone that says, oh, no, we're all going the same place just by a different path, let them know that Jesus said differently. He made an exclusive claim. There's exclusivity in the Bible. The Lord Jesus, uh, he, he was putting it out there. He was saying there is no other way. Acts 4.12 says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the only way of salvation. And if we know that and believe that to be true, we ought to be sharing that. Uh, and there's, um, I believe, uh, I don't know his first name, but there's, a, there's a, um, an illusionist act. Uh, it's a magic slash comedy by Penn and Teller. Penn and Teller are a comedy duo, uh, and they're magicians, you know, illusionists, and they perform, uh, they're, in that, in that realm, they're very famous. And you can look them up, and they can do some really cool tricks and that type, type of thing. But they are uh, atheists, and they'll proclaim that. They'll let, the, let folks know. But what I appreciate, I think it's Mr. T uh, Mr. Penn who shares this. I might be wrong. But he says he appreciates it when someone will try to proselytize him, is what he calls it. When someone's sharing the gospel. Why does he appreciate it? Because he recognizes... That if a person really believes, really believes what the Bible teaches, 
If a person really believes there is a real hell, they're loving enough to share it with him. They're loving him enough to share the truth with him. He might not believe it's the truth. We know it to be the truth. But he related, I watched uh, about a about a three to five minute clip of, of what he was saying there. And it, was, it had some colorful language in there, if you want to put it that way. But he was relating, how much do you have to hate someone not to share that with them? He doesn't even believe it's the truth, but what he is saying was convicting from a lost person because he was saying, if you really believe this, you ought to be sharing it. You ought to be sharing it. And that's so true. Christian, if Jesus is the only way of salvation, and he is... We ought to be sharing that. We understand, A, uh, as we think about salvation, that all men are lost. B, Jesus provides the only way of salvation. But then we see, C, salvation is received by grace through faith without works. Salvation is received by grace through faith without works. Some folks will hear, okay, so Jesus is the only way of salvation. Okay, I understand I've sinned and I've wronged a holy God. What do I have to do? What can I do now? What can I do to be saved? How, many, uh, how much money do I need to give? What kind of uh, charitable contribution do I need to give? And you know, folks, it's not uncommon uh, for folks to think something like that. Hey, how much do I need to pay to join the church? We know it doesn't work that way. Jesus gave it all. You know, we think, are you washed in the blood? That blood was shed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is not received by works, it's received by grace through faith. The natural tendency of mankind is to assume that they must make amend, amends for their actions. Uh, gentlemen, you'll identify with this, and ladies, you'll probably understand this about your husband or somebody that you've known. What is the quickest way to get a man to try and do something? Tell him, tell him he can't do it. You can't do this. There's no way you can do this. Uh, I'll really, I had a funny story to go with this. My wife, we, we went and got some, uh, we were going through Sam's, and we, I, don't, I won't say we got suckered into it. I guess they were probably pretty good knives. Uh, but somebody had demonstrated one of those knives, and, and we had a wedding to buy for. So we bought the knives as a wedding gift. And if you bought the knife set, you got this, this indestructible uh, cutting board. <clears throat> indestructible. Oh, is that true? So we got to give away the knives, and we got this indestructible cutting board. And, and so we, we'd used it for a long time. And it was a, it was a nice cutting board. It had a picture of, of bread and uh, stuff on it, and it was so it had some sort of tempered glass or something on there. And, and uh, you know, we used it for a while, and Faith said, I don't know exactly how it went, dear, but you basically said, there's no way you can break this, see? And she tapped it with a hammer. And I said, oh, I bet I could break it. She said, no, you can't do that. This is, it's in, unbreakable. I said, give me one swing. And so I took it out to the porch, and I mean, come on. She told me I couldn't do it. And I didn't even, I, I, think, I think what maybe she was expecting was, a, ah, boom, and it would just bounce off or something. But I just did a tap, and it went, and you ask, was it worth it to prove I was right? Yes, it was. No. Anyway, but we think about, we th understand this. <coughs> understand that one of the quickest ways to try and get man to do something is to say he can't do it. So it probably frustrates people, men or women, when they hear, you cannot earn your salvation. Many have tried. They have all failed. No one will get to heaven and say, hey, God, I've done all this, now let me in, as, and, and it work. Many will get there, will get uh, before the Lord and say, Lord, Lord, have we not, fill in the blank, have we not given the charity? Have we not preached in thy name? There will be preachers who stand before God and say, I've done all this for you. And they'll be cast into the lake of fire. They'll be cast out of his presence. He'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. You can't earn it. It's received by grace through faith without works. Good works are to be a result of salvation, never a means to get it. Did you catch that? Good works are to be a result of salvation, never a means for salvation. Romans 11.6 says, And if by grace, 
that it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. Galatians 2.21 I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. That verse goes with both truths, uh, letter B and C. If Jesus was not the only way of salvation, his death would be in vain. If we could work our way to heaven, Jesus didn't have to die. But how do we know uh, the importance of him being the only way is that he did go to the cross. There is no other way of salvation. And he proved it. But God commendeth his love toward us. And that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. He's the only way. He made the way that we could be saved. Understand that Titus 3.5 This is not by works of righteousness, which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. He's the one that saves. He is the only way of salvation. Letter D, letter D. <coughs> letter D says, once received, our salvation is eternal and secure. Once received, our salvation is eternal and secure. Our salvation is referred to over and over again in God's word as eternal life or everlasting life. This means that when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, we receive life that will never end. It cannot stop, it cannot be taken away, and it cannot be lost. John 10, verse 27 through 29. It says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my Father's hand. Excuse me, out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Did you catch that? Uh, we are in the Lord Jesus' hand. We're covered and we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Nobody's taking us out. No one can make me remove, lose my salvation. And when it said no man can pluck uh, them out of my hand, guess what? You cannot take yourself out of his hand either. Uh, once a person is truly born again, you cannot sin your way out of salvation. Now, if you just heard that and thought, oh, that means I can do whatever I want to, that is not what I said. Uh, if you are truly born again, uh, that will not be the desire of your heart. That will not, you will not have that attitude of, well, whoop de doo I'm saved, so now I can do everything I want to. All the, all the sins that are out there, I will, can commit them. A truly born again Christian, now get this, a truly born again Christian should not want to sin. And if you do not want to sin, catch this now, if you do not want to sin, then you can sin all you want because there wouldn't be any sin that you would want to do. I probably just lost some people on that. I'm trying to say is, if you're truly born again, you ought not want to sin. I know that flesh is in you and there's going to be times where we mess up, we make those wrong decisions. I get that. But a life of sin, just that's what we're going to revel in, that's what we're going to love. We don't see that. We don't see that in Scripture. You know, the Bible says, Delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. That's not saying, if I'm delighted in the Lord, I can go to the, go to the store and I just get to get this and this and this. And this. No, he's giving you the desires. What you are going to desire will be from him. So understand that <coughs> we ought to desire to serve him. Our salvation is eternal and secure. The Lord Jesus constantly used eternal life, everlasting life. He's not going to lose us. He's not going to lose us. Uh, when, I was in, uh, when I was young, uh, I don't know, I was probably about 10 or 11, maybe younger. Um, I remember going to SeaWorld with my aunt, uh, her daughters, and my grandma Schneider. We went to SeaWorld, and we went to, I think it was right after we went and saw the, the big uh, killer whales do their show, and we got soaked and all that good stuff. But after the show, I got lost. I got lost in the, cr in the crowd. And, you know, they were going somewhere. And I'm just 10 years old in the middle of a big place called Sea SeaWorld's a big place, especially for a 10-year-old. I didn't know where to go. I think I started crying because there was, I didn't know what to do. What happened? They lost me. Guess what? 
The Lord Jesus will never lose you in Sea World. He's never going to lose you in this world. He knows right where you are. And if you're one of his, he's not going to lose you, amen? He's not going to lose you. <coughs> Hebrews 13, 5 says, He has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. It is God's power, not our performance, that keeps us saved. It is God's power, not our performance, that keeps us saved. Understand that. I'm so glad uh, that salvation doesn't work like a basketball team, does it? Basketball team, I played uh, when I was in high school, and for some reason, because I was in a really small high school, I understand this. If I was, would have been in a big school, they wouldn't have let me play because I wasn't that good. But my coach valued effort and hustle. And I'll say probably 99% of the time after um, my freshman year, I got on varsity, and 99% of the time I started. Why? Not because I was any good, but because I tried really, really hard and ran harder than anybody. And I'm not saying that as a pat on the back. I'm saying I, I wanted to play, so I gave it my all. I earned my way onto the starting lineup. Well, guess what, Christian? It doesn't work that way with salvation. We didn't earn our way into salvation, and our performance doesn't keep us saved. Now, we ought to want to perform for the Lord, not, not as a means of, I want something, but as a means of, thank you, Lord, you've saved me. I just want to please you. Man, I just love it when, and I know things probably, will, Brother Tim, you got three girls, and they're all getting older. It probably changes. It probably changes from a, I just love you, Daddy, to more of a, I want something. Uh, but, but there are times where Bella uh, will just crawl up in my lap. I just love you, Daddy. I love you. And she'll wrap her arms around. I want to give you a kiss. And she just, she's not old enough where she's, under, she's not thinking, hey, I can get something. She's just loving on her dad. Hey, it's the way we ought to treat the Lord is, is just love on him. It's not a, hey, God, give me this, so now I'll go do this for you. No, just love on him. You'd be surprised. Uh, i got to tell you, there's nothing uh, within my means of giving to Bella when she climbs up in my lap and just loves on her daddy. Do you think there's anything that I want to withhold from her? No, when she's just doing that all on her own, I'm like, hey, let me go to the, let me go to the refrigerator and fix you some chocolate milk and some ice cream, and, and we'll give Mommy the, the sore stomach later, but no. Uh, but I enjoy it. You know, I love it. And the Lord, I, I, you know, we, we understand a lot of things as fathers as we understand from the Lord, and I just got to think the Lord's kind of somewhat like that as far as when we just love on him. He, he loves to give stuff. To, he loves to pour his blessings on us. We just ought to enjoy it. Thank him for it. Thank him for it. I don't know why I got off on that, but hey, that's, that's a long way off from security, I guess, of salvation. But I understand that our salvation is secure, and the Lord loves us, and he's given it to us. Amen? Understand <clears throat> 2 Timothy 1.12. For the which cause I also suffer these things... Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able. What is he able to do? To keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. God is able to keep us. He is able. He is able to keep us. So understand it's not in our performance. It's in his power. It's in his promise. Number two, the terms that... <coughs> Excuse me for that. <clears throat> the terms that describe our salvation. The terms that describe our salvation. I know you don't have a lot of space on your lesson there uh, to write the definitions, but I'll give them twice. And if later on you get home, uh, we'll have this recorded and put up online where you can get these terms and their definitions. Or if you want to borrow this book, as long as you give it right back to me, after you type them down or write them down, I'd be happy to do that. Letter A. Letter A. These are the terms that describe our salvation. Letter A is substitution. Substitution. So what happened when somebody talks about the uh, substitution in our salvation, what are they saying? Substitution is Jesus taking our place on the cross and paying our penalty for sin. Substitution is Jesus taking our place on the cross and paying our penalty for sin. Relate, relating basketball, in my senior year, we had a, our first game in state playoffs. My senior year, we lost our first game in state playoffs, and I hardly played. Why? The first quarter, about two minutes into it, I got my second foul. Now, I didn't really agree with the referee on what he called for a foul, but he called it. 
So within two minutes, I got two fouls. If you're familiar with basketball at all, you only get five of them. So if you got two of them in two minutes, you're going to go ahead and sit down. So what happened? My coach said, hey, so-and-so, go in for James. They went and reported to the table. They came in for me, and I went and sat down. They were my substitute. Well, guess what? The Lord Jesus was our substitute on the cross. He is the only one that could have been our substitute. Substitution is Jesus taking our place on the cross and paying our penalty for sin. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. The Bible says that he became sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You know, he was our substitute. Letter B, reconciliation. Reconciliation. Reconciliation is the bringing together of two parties, God and man, who have been separated by sin. I'll read that again. Reconciliation is the bringing together of two parties, God and man, who have been separated by sin. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18 through 19 says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So we have experienced reconciliation with Christ, or through Christ with God. He's, he's brought us back together again. And now we have that opportunity. We have that opportunity to share that truth. Let's, uh, I want to do a little quick demonstration. Hopefully this can be seen online. Uh, Brother Manny and Brother Joe, would you come up here? I want to demonstrate reconciliation. What happened? <coughs> Excuse me. Come on up, gentlemen. Joe is going to represent Adam. And at, you're right here, Joe. Joe is Adam. Manny, he's going to represent God. I know it's a long stretch, but here he is. Okay. And so at the Garden of Eden, at creation, at creation, they were together. So, gentlemen, hold hands. I know, here we are. And now, nothing, but just understand they were together, they, they fellowshiped, they had a relationship. What happened? Adam and Eve, they sinned. That was broken apart. And God was that way. Ugh. Brother Manny's hard to push. He's solid. Adam was over here. And what happened? You had that split between them. They didn't have that fellowship anymore. But Jesus came and he lived that perfect sinless life. As God robed in the flesh and he went to the cross. And what happened on the cross? He reached over and took the hand of God, took the hand of man, and he reconciled them. Once again, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Hopefully that, was a, uh, hopefully that helped some folks to put a picture on that. He reconciled us to himself. And now we have the opportunity and we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. What do you mean by that? We get to share the gospel. We get to share the good news with folks that they don't have to go to hell. They don't have to be an enemy of God. Reconciliation is available. Amen? Thirdly, letter C, propitiation. Propitiation. Propitiation is Jesus satisfying the demands of a holy God through his sacrifice on the cross. Propitiation. Propitiation is Jesus satisfying the demands of a holy God through his sacrifice on the cross. I have not been to a place that was a black tie only type restaurant. I've been to a really ritzy restaurant, but they didn't make you wear a black tie to go there. But you understand that there are places where if you don't have you know, the tie and the suit coat on, they're not going to let you in. That's their rule. So if you show up in jeans and a t-shirt, you're not eating there. I think about brother, uh, Pastor Justin is related uh, with going to Weaver Ridge over. We've been to Weaver Ridge a couple times to play golf over there. You, uh, you wear a collared shirt. You wear khakis. You wear something nicer. It's their rule. They have demands that they set. And if you don't meet them, 
They don't let you in. I don't understand why people can understand. They get that with, with people that operate a business. But they don't understand that a holy God has righteous demands. He's the one that's made us, and he is holy, and he is perfect. And we just think, hey, I'll just get in. He, he'll, just turn it, he'll just turn away. He'll just, he'll, just, he'll just wink at it, you know. He'll let me in. It's not that big a deal. It is that big a deal. And that's why Jesus was our propitiation. What happened? He ju- Jesus satisfied the demands of a holy God through his sacrifice on the cross. The demand of the holy God was a blood sacrifice, a perfect blood sacrifice. And Jesus gave his perfect blood on, in our place. He was our propitiation. Letter D, remission. Remission is the sending away or the putting away of our sins by the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ. Remission is the sending away or the putting away of our sins by the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ. Not only was Jesus our sacrificial lamb, but he was also our scapegoat. In the Old Testament, a scapegoat. Uh, they took two, uh, two, two sheep or two rams, and one would be sacrificed. And they would take the blood of the sacrifice and put it on the scapegoat. And the scapegoat would be led out into the wilderness, and it would never return. So what's that a representative of? The Lord Jesus was our sacrifice, but he's also our scapegoat. He's also the one that took our sins away, never to return. He, he, we have a remission of sins. Letter E, regeneration. Regeneration is being born again into God's family and passing from spiritual death to spiritual life. Regeneration is being born again into God's family and passing from spiritual death to spiritual life. <coughs> Letter F, redemption. Redemption is the setting free of one who was in bondage by paying his ransom price. <clears throat> redemption is the setting free of one who was in bondage by paying his ransom price. I'm going to have to go a little quick on the rest of these. Uh, letter G, imputation. Imputation is God's assigning the righteousness of Jesus Christ to the account of a believing sinner. Imputation is God's assigning the righteousness of Jesus Christ to the account of a believing sinner. Substitution and imputation working together. Jesus on the cross, he took took our sins on him so that his righteousness could be imputed to us. So that we could have his righteousness. Letter H, adoption. Adoption is becoming the child of God receiving all the rights and benefits of being an heir of God. Adoption is becoming the child of God, receiving all the rights and benefits of being an heir of God. You know, if I walked into a stranger's house, I just walked right on in and went to the refrigerator, opened it up and started eating and drinking their stuff, I might get shot depending on who it is, I don't know. But they would definitely be looking at me strange and thinking, who in the world are you? But do you know, if I go into my mom and dad's house, I walk to the refrigerator, I start drinking their stuff, and start eating their food, I'm their son. They understand. Hey, he, he, he's my son. It, it, he, he's welcome to it. Why? Because I'm their son. And we have been adopted into the family of God. We are heirs to everything, that or to the rights and benefits of the Lord. And he blesses us with that. Uh, That's that's a beautiful thing. We have not received Romans 8, 15 through 17. For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That, That cry, Abba, Father, is a cry of endearment. Papa, Father, Daddy. You know, I'm crying out to God. I love him. And I love it when my little girl, Daddy, Daddy. And so a lot of times she'll hide so I can come find her. But then there's other times where she'll see me and say, Daddy, Daddy, and run up and just tackle my leg and give me a big old hug. She's loving me. You know, that, that, that's love coming from a child to her father. We're children of the Lord. We ought to love our God. We ought to love our Father. Letter I, justification. Justification is God's legal declaration 
that a sinner is righteous or innocent as a result of their faith in Christ. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What happened? He justified us. Justification is God's legal declaration that a sinner is righteous or innocent as a result of their faith in Christ. So when some, maybe uh, as some of those songs talk about uh, if, the, if the accuser ever brings up my sin to God, he says, what sin? He's justified. He's freed. He's, he's, uh, he's been justified by faith. I'm legally declared not a sinner anymore. Praise the Lord for that. I'm righteous and innocent as a result of faith in Christ. Number three, the tenses that develop our salvation. The tenses that develop our salvation. Salvation is certainly a miracle in a moment. Praise the Lord for that miracle in a moment, but it doesn't stop there. God wants our salvation to be something that's active in our lives on a daily basis. Think about this. Second, go to uh, 2 Corinthians. I hope I got this right. This isn't from the book. This is uh, my own, own verse here. But look at 2 Corinthians verse number or chapter number 1, verse number 10. And that will sum up all three of these tenses, which we'll look at. But 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 10 speaks about the Lord Jesus. And it says, Who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. If you haven't circled that, circle that. That's a great verse to go with salvation. Why? Because it gives us letter A, the past tense of our salvation. The past tense of our salvation. Who delivered us from so great a death? He saved me. I am saved from the penalty of sin. The present tense of salvation. God's intent is that your salvation would play a meaningful role in your everyday life. He also desires to save us not only from the penalty of sin, but from the power of sin. What do we see there? In verse number 10 again. Who delivered us from so great a death, that was past, and doth deliver. He is delivering me from the power of sin. Understand that he is delivering me from the power of sin. Understand you do not have to live in bondage to habits and besetting sins, strongholds, or compulsions. You don't have to live there. You can have the victory. Why? Because Jesus has won it. You don't have to live in bondage. The victory is available in Christ. The Lord Jesus has saved us from the penalty of sin. He is saving us from the power of sin. And we look at future tense, the future tense of salvation, 2 Corinthians 1.10, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. He will deliver me from the very presence of sin. That's a future tense. Think about that. We had justification. That's a past tense of salvation. I have been justified. The present tense of salvation. Sanctification. He's saving me from the very power of sin. And then glorification. One day, I'll be saved from the very presence of sin. Isn't that a wonderful thought? There will be no sin in heaven. We won't have to deal with it. It won't be there. Temptations won't be there. We will be delivered from the very presence of sin. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to it. In conclusion, I'm going to read this conclusion to you. We'll close in prayer, and we'll be getting ready for church shortly. So you have a great salvation. What are you going to do about it? Let me suggest that you express great gratitude to the Lord for your salvation. Let me challenge you to approach the Christian life with great fervor and great enthusiasm. Let me encourage you to pursue God's will for your life with great diligence. Lastly, let me ask you to share your relationship with Christ. Share this great salvation with great boldness and with great passion to others, others who have yet to experience this great salvation. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the time we got to spend in your word. I pray that every person in the sound of my voice knows you as Savior. God, I pray that your word would go forth to those if they do not know you as Savior and you would penetrate to their heart and show them their need, Lord, that they would run to you 
as their Lord and Savior. Thank you for your great salvation. Thank you for allowing us to have a part in sharing it with others. Help us, Lord, to be bold in our witness. Help us, Lord, to please you who have chosen us to be soldiers. In Jesus' name, amen.